Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to another live streamed author event from Majors and Quinn Booksellers. My name is Annie, and I am the events coordinator at Majors and Quinn, which is in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So, wherever you're joining from, welcome. We're super excited today to have two Minnesota novelists in conversation William Ken Kruger and Leif Enger. Um, they're going to talk about writing and their most recent novels. Um, Ken's new book, uh, This Tender Land, just came available in paperback, and Leif's book, Virgil Wander, is also available in paperback. So they're going to read a little bit, chat with each other, and then they also will, at the end, uh, take questions from you if you have any. So drop those in the Facebook comments underneath this video throughout the event, and at the end, we will get to, hopefully, some of your questions. So without further ado, I would like to bring... William K. Kruger to the screen. Hi, Annie. Hi, folks. Um, first of all, I want to say thanks to uh, Majors and Quinn for hosting this event um, and to Annie for uh, helping with all the technical <laughs> aspects of it. And I also want to thank Leif Anger for being willing to join me in, in conversation this evening. Uh, I've been doing a lot of events lately to promote the paperback release of my latest novel, This Tender Land. For those of you who don't know anything uh, about the novel, here it is. This Tender Land is set in the summer of 1932, uh, deep in the Great Depression. It's the story of four orphans running from the law because they've committed a terrible crime, but for the right reason. They know if they take to the roads to get away, they'll be caught rather quickly because a huge manhunt has been launched to capture them. They're afraid to ride the rails as everybody was doing back in the depression because the railroads back then were patrolled by private cops called bulls. And the bulls had a reputation for being incredibly cruel. So the kids are afraid to ride the rails. Instead, they decide to take to the rivers. They canoe a river called the Gilead to the Minnesota. They canoe the Minnesota to the Mississippi. And their plan is to canoe all the way down the Mississippi River to St. Louis, where they believe they have family and they'll be safe. I've always wanted to write an updated version of Huckleberry Finn. This is my Huckleberry Finn. Um, I've been asked to read uh, brief, briefly from the book, so I'm going to read the prologue. Uh, and I do it for two reasons. First of all, it's very short. It's just a little over a page long. But the other reason I like to read the prologue is that Honest to God, I love this prologue. So this is how I bring readers into this tender land. In the beginning, after he labored over the heavens and the earth, the light and the dark, the land and sea and all living things that dwell therein, after he created man and woman and before he rested, I believe God gave us one final gift. Lest we forget the divine source of all that beauty, he gave us stories. I am a storyteller. I live in the house. I live in a house in the shade of a sycamore tree on the banks of the Gilead River. My great grandchildren, when they visit me here, call me old. Old is a cliche, I tell them with mock disappointment, a terrible trivializing and insult. I was born along with the sun and earth and moon and planets and all the stars. Every atom of my being was there at the very beginning. You're a liar, they scowl but playfully. Not a liar, a storyteller, I remind them. Then tell us a story, they plead. I need no goading. Stories are the sweet fruit of my existence, and I share them gladly. The events I'm about to share with you began on the banks of the Gilead. Even if you grew up in the heartland, you may not remember these things. What happened in the summer of 1932 is most important to those who experienced it, and there are not many of us left. The Gilead is a lovely river, lined with cottonwoods already ancient when I was a boy. Things were different then, not simpler or better, just different. We didn't travel the way we do now, and for most folks in Fremont County, Minnesota, the world was limited to the piece of it they could see before the horizon cut off the land. They wouldn't have understood any more than I did that if you kill a man, you are changed forever. If that man comes back to life, you are transformed. I have witnessed this and other miracles with my own eyes. So among the many pieces of wisdom life has offered me over all these years is this. Open yourself to every possibility 
for there is nothing your heart can imagine that is not so. The tale I'm going to tell is of a summer long ago, of killing and kidnapping and children pursued by demons of a thousand names. There will be courage in this story and cowardice. There will be love and betrayal. And of course, there will be hope. In the end, isn't that what every good story is about? Thanks very much. And now I think we're going to turn the uh, the program over to life, to life for a little while. Hey, <laughs> Kent, I, I love listening to you read that prologue. Uh, you, you're such a good reader, and that is such a lovely way to fall into that story. I've heard you read the prologue a couple times, once up here in Duluth, um, and now, and and both times I find that even though I've read this book, I'm just falling right back into it. Uh, boy, that's the mark of a, of a good story. Thanks for reading that. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks to Majors and Quinn and, and Annie for setting this up. I'm, I'm just delighted to be able to, to step in and uh, read a little bit from my latest book, which is Virgil Wander. Um, and I'm, I'm going to read from uh, an early section in the book. Uh, this is about a man named Virgil. Uh, who lives in a small town up on the north shore of Lake Superior, up in the Inland Sea. And he owns and operates a, a small movie theater in a dying town uh, called Greenstone. Um, in the early chapter, first chapter, he, uh, he suffers a, uh, in a car accident, a, a bad head injury. And this is a scene where he is confronted with his neurologist um, after he wakes up in the hospital. My neurologist was a Finn named Koskinen with a broad, decent face and a Teddy Roosevelt mustache. He diagnosed mild traumatic brain injury. This sounded paradoxical, but so did everything else he said. For example, the damage was short term, but might last quite a while or possibly longer than that. I could expect within months to regain my balance as long as I didn't tip over, to experience fewer headaches or maybe just get used to them. He said over time I would remember the names of friends and the nearer relatives, that I would recover fine motor skills and pockets of personal history I didn't yet realize had vanished. Despite my confusion, I liked Koskinen immediately. He had the heartening bulk of the aging athlete defeated by pastry. He delivered all news as though it were good. Most welcome was his prediction that language would gradually return. Not that I couldn't speak, but I had to stick to basics. My storehouse of English had been pillaged. At first I thought common nouns were hardest hit, coffee and doorway and so on, but it soon became clear that the missing were mostly adjectives. Don't worry, everything will come back, said Dr. Koskinen. Most things probably will. A good many of them might return. There will be at least a provisional rebound. How does this make you feel? I wanted to say relieved or encouraged or at least hopeful. But none of these were available. All I could muster was a mute grin at which the doctor nodded with his mouth open in a vaguely alarming smile. He was correct about the language though. Within weeks, certain prodigal words started filtering home. They came one at a time or in shy small groups. I remember when Sea Kindly showed up, a sentimental favorite, followed by desiccated and massive. Brusque appeared all by itself, which seemed apt. Mary and Boisterous arrived together. This would be a good time to ask for your patience. If I use an adjective too many now and again, even now, some years later, they are still returning. I'm just so glad to see them. So that's a little bit from, uh, from Virgil, which is out in paperback from um, Majors and Quinn. So uh, thanks for listening. And uh, Kent, are you still around? Have you, have you hung in there? I have no intention of leaving you, Life. <laughs> that was so lovely. That's just delightful. That's just so, the language is just, ah. Oh. Thank you very much. I love that. Aging athlete defeated by pastry. <laughs> this, is, this is really kind of a, um, a fun thing to do. I mean, there you are in your home, right? Here I yeah. am in mine. Um, yeah. There's Danny at the bookstore. 
people are starting to, to tune in and chime in. Um, wow, what fun. What a nice Saturday afternoon. Well, you know, this is the, there, there are so many downsides to the pandemic, but the upside is um, that actually events like this are much easier to yeah. arrange and for folks to attend. And um, I, I typically do them in my pajamas. Um, I dress <laughs> one day. <laughs> hey, I do have a question for you, since we just so, sort of touched on the coronavirus. Has, has the pandemic affected your writing? Um, and if so, in what ways? Uh, you know, um, for me, the pandemic has been uh, timely and weirdly uh, wonderful. Um, yeah. Because um, I had been making notes for a, for a, the next novel for about a year, but I hadn't written any prose. I had just written, you know, um, several hundred pages of character sketches and sort of scene sketches, but I hadn't written a word of actual prose. And when it looked like we were going into lockdown, I thought, well, all of my stuff has been canceled. I've got nothing else to do. Why don't I see how far I can get by summertime? And I'm, I'm literally days from finishing the first draft of this book. Um, oh. it, I, I've, I've never had such a, a spate of productivity. What about you? Has it has it helped or has it been a trouble thing for you? I so um, understand where you're coming from because I I am in a very fecund period. Ah, nice. I'm so glad to hear that. Uh, and I think part of it is, is that you, just as you said, um, so many of the distractions are now removed. I, I had a very long, rather rigorous uh, tour planned for the for the novel, for the release yeah. of the the paperback that was going to take me all over the country and uh, and take me away from my um, my writing. You know, I always try to write even when I'm on tour, yeah. uh, but I get very little accomplished in truth. Uh, but now I uh, sit at my kitchen counter every morning and it's just flowing. So I finished the next in the Cork O'Connor series. Hey, congratulations. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I kind of like it. Uh, typically <laughs> it would be after the fall, but the pandemic, um, a lot of publishers because of the pandemic yeah. are uh, holding off publishing many of their books until next year. So my next novel won't be out until the fall of 2021. And I just finished the novella that I have no idea what I'm going to do with, but oh. it was fun to write. So where uh, did this where did this come from, the novella? Well, it, it was a short story I attempted 20 years ago and finally decided it was a much larger story than, than I could fit into a short story. Uh, so I had some time between uh, contractual obligations and I thought, what the hell? I knuckled down to it, and uh, for the last uh, two or three weeks, I've just been uh, in heaven, actually, with oh. the writing. It's been wonderful. It's been wonderful. Well, say more about the novella form, because this is something, every time I read Jim Harrison, for example, my yeah. favorite yeah. practitioner, um, I think, oh, I want to try that form, but I've never done it. Uh, it, it. How do you find it compared with writing novels? Shorter. <laughs> Of course, and maybe I don't know. Is it? Does it seem? I remember Tom McGuane one time said, "Whenever I go into a, a novel, I know that I'm going to go into that tunnel, and I'm not going to come out for a long time." Um, is it? Is a novella? Is it, is it easier or like short stories? Is it deceptively difficult? Well, first of all, I, I, I find that an interesting comment by McGuane. Um, I've always been a, a fan of his writing. But, but to make the comparison to going into a, law, into a tunnel, I'm thinking, oh, that's darkness. That's just so oh, bleak. Doesn't make you want to start. Writing is all about opening up, you know, yes. letting the sunshine in. <laughs> um, but what I found is, is that because it's more focused, um, I can still, and, and really, I'm, I deal with one or two central themes as opposed to lots of themes, trying to braid lots of things together. The, the writing was, was rather easy, and I tried, uh, I tried a different kind of a structure this time around. I've never done uh, present tense, and it's a novel written in present tense. And boy, was that a fun, uh, fun experiment to try. Um, so it's just, what can I say? I, I have another novella sort of at work in my head now going, well, you did that one. Sure, you can do another one. <laughs> Although I have contractual obligations in the Cork O'Connor series still to me. Right. Wait. Tell us, if you're willing, a little bit about 
the next book we can expect. I, I have so been waiting for the next book. I got to tell you, I got to tell you, Leif, between um, Peace Like a River and So Brave, Young and Handsome, I felt like I was in a desert. I was so waiting for this next. You think um, it took album. a long time for you. <laughs> I was, <laughs> I, I'll tell you what, um, 10 years between books is way too long. And I had a conversation with a guy at, uh, in New York who said, yeah, but you know, he said, maybe, maybe that's just your fingerprint. Maybe it just takes you a long time. And he said, uh, your books, he said, I find to be worth the wait, which I thought was really nice to hear. But at the same time, when he said, that's just your DNA, um, I thought, oh, no, <laughs> because I don't have many of these decades left. So uh, I was really hopeful that if I just buckled down and I avoided distraction, um, that I could that I could write faster and still write reasonably well. And I have to say, I'm really happy about this book. Um, I don't want to say a whole lot about it. it I, I can tell you that it's, while it's not a sequel to Virgil, it takes place on Lake Superior. Um, In your territory. Uh, yeah, Lake Superior is very much a character. Uh, it takes place 25 or 30 years from now in the future, wow. uh, which is something I haven't attempted before. Um, and a little bit of world building is involved, but not a whole lot because I have not written, um, a, for example, a post-apocalypse novel. Um, I don't feel like I have one of those in me, uh, maybe because I am innately optimistic and I don't think the apocalypse is coming, at least not yet. Uh, so I'm, I'm writing, um, a story that, that moves around on Lake Superior, and there's a great deal of storytelling. There's a there's a, a, a lot of um, there's a lot of travel. It's a little bit of a road book, but the road is the lake itself. There's um, there's a lot of action on the water, um, and I had so much fun and and completely fell for these characters. So um, thanks for your interest. Yeah. <laughs> and tell yeah. me about tell me about the latest Cork book. Well, because I will. You said you finished. You finished the new Cork O'Connor. I have, and I will. I will say something about that in just a minute, if you remind me. It's hard for me. To I will. Focus. But I just want to say this. You know, I um. I think that you are one of the finest, if maybe not the finest, worker in in words uh, around today. I just love reading your prose because it's so beautiful and your choice. Oh, of that's awfully. That's awesome. awfully kind. Refreshing. But I also think that um, that we cover a lot of the same territory. A lot yeah. of the same elements appear in our work. We both write out of a deep love for Minnesota uh, and sort of with, with a kind eye towards small towns and the people that live there. Right. Um, I know that there are mystical qualities to your work, which I so appreciate because, you know, I do that in mine as well. Um, language is important. I just love your language. Um, so, yeah, I'm a groupie. Oh, well, and, and the thing is, here's what's great. Uh, what I so appreciate when I open one of your books, um, and I'm talking about your crime novels as well, um, although although clearly Ordinary Grace and This Tender Land uh, exemplify this for me, and that is your sense of generosity to both your readers and to your characters. You can always tell, I think, when a writer loves his characters, has real affection for his characters. And I see that on every page of your books. And I appreciate that so much because whenever that is missing in a book, then um, A, I have a hard time finishing that book. Oh, boy, howdy. Uh, and, and B, uh, it makes me, it makes me question the, the motives of the writer. If they, if they don't love their characters, then often I feel like, oh, I'm being lectured to. I'm being told how I need to think about this thing or that. And I have resistance to that. Um, and so I tend to, to love writers like yourself or like, like Jim Harrison, who we mentioned before we came on, because Harrison just loves the people he's writing about. Uh, if you read the Brown Dog novellas, um, I feel like Brown Dog probably lives just up my street. Uh, and, and, and I'll know him when I see him, you know, uh, because Harrison loved that, that person so much. And that is definitely something that I uh, that will always bring me back to your books. 
Well, well thank you. And that quality is in the Cork O'Connor books as well. Okay, so the next Cork O'Connor book. Yeah. Um, this is this will be number eighteen in the series. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, I have to kick myself sometimes. <laughs> um, it's called Lightning Strike, and it's actually a prequel to the series. It, oh, uh, it's it's of Cork O'Connor and the summer uh, just before his thirteenth birthday. Um, for those uh, who are familiar with my series, uh, they may remember that uh, Cork O'Connor's father was sheriff of Tamarack County, as Cork became later, uh, when Cork was a boy and his father was killed in the line of duty. Lightning Strike takes Cork essentially in the summer before his father is killed. And what it's allowing me to do, Leif, is, uh, is take a look at the important relationships that help form Cork into the man he is. So it looks at the relationship Cork had with his father, the relationship he had with his mother, the relationship his parents had, all of these really important formative relationships. Um, for those of you who know my series, you know Henry Malou. In the series now, he's 105 years old, but in Lightning Strike, he's this spry 65 year old guy. <laughs> so, <laughs> great to see Malou young. Sam <laughs> uh, Moon is alive. I've, I've had a very enjoyable experience writing this novel. Um, so again, that'll be out in the fall of uh, 2021. So this makes me wonder something about, about what it was like to write a prequel to a longstanding and beloved series. Um, Stephen King wrote something in, in his book about writing, on writing, um, which is one of the better books on writing that I've come across. Oh, I think it's a, just a great nuts and bolts approach. It totally oh, is. Uh, but remember, he said something in there about your second draft is when you go back and you, um, how did he phrase that? It was like, you go back and you make everything look like it wasn't an accident. Uh, in <laughs> other words, the stuff that came to you during the writing of the first draft and came along and surprised you by the end, you go in and you build in uh, the foundations so that that doesn't seem like a strange twist. And, and it makes so much sense. Um, and that's the way all my books have worked out. Um, but I wonder if you go back and you write a prequel to your long standing series, is there an element of that where you can say, oh, okay, so here's what Cork became over the years. I get to go back and set it up so that now all of that stuff just rings true. Does that happen? Mostly it was the case where I had to go back and uh, do rereading of the books where I had made allusions to Cork's childhood to make sure that everything was correct. So you didn't and screw it up. Yeah, I, I did. I screwed it up in, in several places that had to be fixed. <laughs> and, uh, and there's one place uh, that, uh, that I had given across the course of my series two different dates for things that occurred in Cork's life. And I had no way of reconciling the difference in those dates. So I'm hoping that, that readers don't pick up on the discrepancies. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I know readers. Some will, I, because readers are careful, man. I know. I, I get emails all the time, notes from uh, readers who love my work, but who say, but, but, Mr. Kruger, I want to point out. Oh, that's really funny. Yeah, I have uh, friends who write long running series, and they have kept copious notes, files on characters, facts, things that they put in the files. And I'm thinking now, what a good idea that would have been. <laughs> <laughs> so, at least you're not collaborating. Um, years ago when Lynn and I, my brother Lynn and I were collaborating on a series of crime novels. They were set well, in Northern they were Minnesota. Baseball crime novels, right? Baseball. What's that? Baseball, baseball yeah. background. Yeah, they were, they were about a retired ball player named Gunn Peterson. And, uh, and that was so much fun to do. And it was fun to have a collaborator and we would send pages back and forth through the mail. Uh, but one thing that, that did happen, and I think we were pretty... I think we got pretty good at being seamless, so you couldn't tell where I left off and Lynn picked up. Um, nonetheless, things like this would happen. We had a character in one book um, who who had lost his hands in an accident, and and he had so he had uh, you know these prosthetic hands. Um, uh, but what he had were these kind of rough hooks that you would have had back in the day, right? And uh, and I don't know who did it, but one of us wrote a winter scene in which he was wearing mittens. And we, and we heard from people about that. It was like, I don't think you meant to write this. Uh, so there, we were always kind of tripping each other up in that, in that way. 
<laughs> so you didn't catch it. Your copy editor didn't catch it. Your editor didn't catch it. Yeah. No, no. So, okay, here's one for you. Here's one for you. I don't know. Are you a fisherman? Uh, not a very good one. <laughs> yeah, nor, nor am I. The only fishing I've ever done is for trout. And in this Tenderland, uh, I have a, a situation where character joins my vagabonds at a campfire and he's brought catfish with him. And I have a line where he had already skinned the he had already scaled the catfish. Uh -huh. And I had so many right um, people who have who are catfish fisher people right yep. and me, catfish don't have scales. <laughs> <laughs> you skin them, but you don't skin them. <laughs> oh, what do I know? So we got it changed in the paperback edition. Oh, you did? That's good. I actually appreciate it when readers write and tell me about the errors that have occurred in the books. So we yeah. can we can get things corrected for the paperback editions. Yeah. I, and sometimes, even if you do research, you can you can kind of blow it. Um, uh, when my Western came out in 2008, so Brave, Young, and Handsome, um, I, I went to great lengths to, to research the type of gun that this character was carrying. Um, and I read all about it. I thought I was on it, right? And I got a long, eloquent, scolding letter from a gentleman in Wyoming who set me straight about the error of my ways. It, it kind of made my gear. Um, I, I had made a very fundamental mistake. I couldn't tell you what it is anymore. It's a long time ago. Um, but I love how careful people are. Readers are, are not to be underestimated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, which, is, um, which makes me feel really, uh, pl which pleases me enormously that yeah. they they uh, like the work well enough to read it carefully, and they are so deeply uh, drawn into the story that it's real for them yeah. until they get this thing that they know is wrong. I, yeah. I, hate, I hate pulling a reader out of a story with something like that, you know, yeah. even a typo. But isn't it a great compliment when they reach out to you? Yeah. It, well, it depends on how they reach out. I've had some. <laughs> <laughs> emails from high rate readers for various reasons <laughs> over the years. <laughs> so um, when you are writing, and I've, I've, I've wondered this a lot because you're writing crime fiction, you're writing uh, literary fiction at the same time. Uh, is there, is there a, uh, a line that you have to draw to go back and forth? Do you do something differently or is the process kind of the same for you? Between the standalones and the mysteries, yes, yeah, very different processes. And I want to I want to talk about your process as well. I always like I like talking process with other writers. Um, so when I write a Cork O'Connor novel, because uh, it is uh, generally speaking, there's a mystery at the heart of it. And you know, from your own experience, you know that a mystery is a very tightly woven fabric of storytelling. Everything depends so significantly on everything else, and the timing of the reveals is so important in maintaining the suspense, playing fair with the reader and all of that. So that when I write one of my Cork O'Connor novels, I do my best to think the whole story through before I begin to write it. It's usually rolling around in my head for several weeks or even several months. And by the end of that thinking period, I know how it begins, I know how it ends, I know who did what to whom and why, I know the major themes I wanna weave into the story. Uh, but the standalones have been a very different process that, that Ordinary Grace and its companion novel, The Stender Land. Um, I wanted a different experience. Um, and I, I went into those writing of those manuscripts knowing very little about the stories. I knew maybe three or four salient things. So going into this tender land, um, I knew the, I knew th there were going to be kids involved in a river journey. Um, I knew that the journey they're on in the experiences they have, um, those experiences were going to mirror many of the experiences that Odysseus had in his journey from Troy, his long epic journey from Troy back to Ithaca. I didn't know which of those experiences I was going to use in the story. Um, I, knew, I knew some of the themes I wanted to build into it. I knew I wanted to talk about family. What really is family? What makes family? I wanted to talk about the spiritual journey because I do that in almost all of my writing. Um, I wanted to talk, as I do in so much of my work, about forgiveness and compassion. How, as human beings, do we find it in our hearts to forgive? Um, 
and so I, uh, I I went into the story knowing basically those kinds of things, and I let the stories, this and ordinary grace, reveal themselves to me. Life, and I have to ex I have to tell you, they were two of the most extraordinary storytelling experiences I've ever had. Um, and so, when you were when you were doing that, and you were writing the early pages, um, it sounds to me like you were you were essentially shining a flashlight right down in front of you and not knowing exactly where the path was leading. Um, you were just letting it be revealed a step or two at a time, or, or, or was it um, more planned out than that? Uh, not so much more planned out than that. I, I had the sense of the structure. There were gonna be this many sections to the book. Each section would deal with a particular experience, a particular set of people, uh, but beyond that, no. And so, you know, the, the old analogy that uh, um, E.L. Doctorow, headlights, I can see as far as the headlights will show me. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So both of those were written in that way. But I could never do a Cork O'Connor novel that way. It just, um, it's so hmm, anathema to my whole, <laughs> my whole approach. <laughs> Uh, as it's always been in those novels. Although I have to, I have to say, I I have let up a, I have loosened a little bit the reins after I create the uh, the outline for the story. And how do you tell me about your whole process? When do you write, for example? Um, well, uh, I get up in the morning and I start uh, with uh, with morning pages. I don't know if you do any any journaling. Um, I do a thing that. Um, that Julie Cameron, who wrote The Artist's Way, talked about as the morning pages. And that is just you get up in the morning whenever it is uh, and you sit by yourself with, uh, uh, with a pen and a notebook and you write longhand uh, for 30 minutes as, as fast as you can, uh, whatever is on your mind. It's not really a journal in that it, you're not writing it for posterity. You're not writing it for yourself later. You're not writing it that, uh, to look back on or to be profound in you're just it's just an exercise you're loosening up you're mm -hmm. um it's like in babar you know the setting up exercises uh these are your setting up exercises um and and you write four or five pages as fast as you can um and i i do that and i just enjoy it uh, i have i've started writing in the mornings with a fountain pen which happens to be right here um and i've got a bottle of ink and I and I write with the fountain pen for for half an hour, and I do um, I do a little you know just a, just a little bit of exercise that way in the morning, and then um, when I feel like that's done, uh, I just I get into the book and I start I start writing prose, pretty bad prose, um, pretty quickly. Uh, I, I used to be a really slow writer of first drafts, and uh, and this this new project is an experiment for me. Uh, mm -hmm. In what? Um, uh, who is uh, who is that wonderful writer um, who wrote um, Blue Shoes and uh, uh, Bird by Bird? Uh, Annie Lamott. Anne Lamott. Anne Lamott talks about uh, the need for a shitty first draft, right? Um, Hang on a sec. <laughs> So I will just say to anyone watching that, um, that my current first draft has been enormous fun to write uh, and that I've really written it quickly and that it's, it's pretty bad prose um, for the most part. But I'm quite at peace with that because where, where the magic always happens for me is in the rewrite. Um, I always end up throwing away most of my first draft. Oh my God. Yeah, I do. Um, most of it doesn't stay. Oh. Uh, I, I go back and I, on my second and third drafts, I just hammer those sentences until they do what I want them to do. Um, and, and until they do it, I'm not letting them out of my sight. Uh, but my first draft is ruinous. Um, it's, uh, it's just a dreadful, a dreadful piece of work. But all these good things are happening inside of that dreadful piece of work. And I know that on, on draft number two, which I'll get to in a week or two, um, uh, good things will come out of it. I'm quite confident. So that's, um, that's my weird and messy process. You know, um, uh, Fitzgerald wrote the same way. He thought the first draft was, was a piece of crap. 
and all of the magic that happens happens in the revisions. I'm so different. I do write very slowly. I write very carefully. And my goal is to finish the first draft and uh, sit back and look at it and go, oh my God, what a beautiful thing this is. <laughs> But see, you say you write slowly, but you're not writing slowly. You've got 18 Cork O'Connor books. <laughs> well, you know, your standalones. I'm you, so envious of you, Kent. You can, write, you can write pretty slowly and still put out a book a year, you know, a manuscript <laughs> a year. <laughs> I, oh, that's that's really, really, um, the, the revision process is the most difficult part of the process for me. Going back, I, I know it's necessary and always feel good when I'm finished with it. Um, my revisions, you know, and you know the process. I don't know about you. It goes to my agent. She has suggestions to make. I revise again. It goes to my editor. He has suggestions to make. I revise it again. The copy editor, I revise it again. So yeah. by the time readers see it, it's gone through a, a, a bucket load of revisions. Yeah. Do you enjoy the revision, though? I know that's the hard work, but do you do you, do you enjoy it? Is it kind of thrilling? The revisions? Yeah. Um. What I like about the revisions is I can always see as I'm going through them that it's making it better. And that's the goal in the end, is to write the very best story that I can with the help of the good editorial eyes I have available to me. Yeah. And you know, every writer needs a good editorial eye. You know this. Oh, how lucky are we to have editors no. work? Too. I know. Uh, I, I, would, I would not want to work without one. Are you, are you with Atlantic? Atlantic yeah. Road? Yeah. yeah. And you've always had a, a terrific team there. Oh, they're wonderful. And and what's so cool about working with Grove is it's basically the same people that I signed up with 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, you know, it's been almost 20 years since Peace Like a River. Uh, and and I signed up with them because I loved the people when I talked to them on the phone. Um, and, and they are still there. Elizabeth Schmitz is still my editor. It's fantastic. That's um, so rare. That's it's so, so rare, rare to have that kind of continuity. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that way. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if we should uh, begin uh, looking at some of the questions that are coming to us yeah. and uh, maybe addressing those. Um, let's see if we've got a full. So you've got the list of questions there. I do, yeah. Okay, let's see. Can you both talk about your next books? Give us a, a little preview. We just did that. <laughs> like, do you intentionally set out to write quirky characters? I love the cast from Virgil Wander. Couldn't oh, agree you know, more. Quirky, quirky is is something that um, I've heard a lot about this book. Uh, quirky characters. I have to admit, I I grew up in Osakis, which is a small town in Minnesota, and I I just. Um, Maybe one man's quirky is another man's normal. Uh, they just don't, the people in Greenstone don't seem all that quirky to me. They just seem like the people I grew up around. Um, and, you know, I find that here in Duluth, slightly larger town, still just uh, re everybody's quirky if you, if you get to know them a little bit. Um, everybody has an interesting history, a great story to tell something that is um, intriguingly wrong with them. Uh, it's, it's, it's a marvelous um, thing just to listen to people talk. Uh, Kent, you know how this is. Uh, your, your characters have a certain way of talking that tells me that you're one of these fellows who goes to a ball game and, and listens to the people around you. Actually, it's coffee shops. I go to coffee shops and I listen to the people around me. Yeah. I wrote for 25 years at the St. Clair Broiler and we had a set of regulars there. Uh, <laughs> these, guys, these guys were always parking themselves across uh, in the seat across the booth from me, telling yeah. me these long pointless stories that they were sure I was going to want to use in my next novel, uh, which I never did. But um, I would listen to these guys talk at the counter and I, I would pull bits and pieces, um, whole cloth, uh, from their conversations and put them in my work. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. Um, and that question came from Pam uh, Pam Gordo. Thank you, Pam. Um, here's another one. Um, I missed the beginning. Are, are Leif and WKK friends in regular life? Um, well, I don't think we would know each other without writing. We um, wouldn't. But we have known each other sort of for kind of a long time. I mean, I remember meeting you down in, was it Stillwater? 
in Stillwater. I interviewed you in Stillwater. Right. Do you remember how we be, how I began that that uh, that conversation with you? I said I don't. I to introduce Life Erickson. Oh, oh wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> that is a really common <laughs> mistake. Life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's funny. But uh, you know, here's the thing: we, Kent and I are not uh, like neighbors or anything. Um, but I, I have no doubt that if we were neighbors, we'd hang out. <laughs> I absolutely agree. I certainly, I certainly feel that we are compatriots. Yeah, I uh, think we are. Very much kindred. Robin and I have this sort of ongoing joke. My wife, Robin, and I, whenever there's somebody that we know, um, that we don't know in real life, but we know on television, um, you know, characters that we like on TV, uh, we'll say, you know, they'd make a pretty good neighbor here on 4th Street in Duluth. Why don't they move to 4th Street? Um, and so it's sort of for us, that's an honorary thing. Uh, Kent, you'd be totally at home here on 4th Street. You should just move in. Uh, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll come up and we'll uh, we'll sh share beers, okay? Yeah, sounds good. Let me know what the new norm is. <laughs> hey, here's another question um, from, let's see, who is this? Ooh, I can't see which one it is. But does your new title, does your new book have a, your manuscript have a title yet? Um, it has a working title. Um, the working title, which may not turn out to be the actual title, is The Optimist at Midnight. Oh, I love it. I love it. Uh, it's nice to have a working title that you've got something to move toward. It kind of gives yeah. you a, a set of goalposts or a direction. Um, so that, that was what I used to get through the first draft. Yeah. When do titles come to you? Do they come before you do the work? Do they come during the work? Do they come after? Uh, usually kind of during, during the work. Um, not before. Um, and, and Virgil took a long time. Virgil had two dozen titles while I was writing it. Um, and, and then finally, with the help of Grove Atlantic, just said, well, why don't we just call it Virgil Wander? Yeah, it's a great uh, idea. And I, I thought that worked well. Yeah. What about you? But before I do that, I vote for the optimist at midnight. <laughs> okay. That's my ballot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, titles. When do your titles uh, come to you? Uh, in the Cork O'Connor series, uh, titles uh, very often come before I begin the work, and they help me shape uh, the work itself. Sometimes they, I've had to struggle with a title, um, yeah. and that's been uncomfortable. And in the end, I, there are a couple of titles I haven't been 100% sure of. Um, Ordinary Grace, the companion novel to this tender land. Mm -hmm. The working title for that manuscript was Awful Grace, uh, which is taken from uh, a quote that's important to the work, quote by the Greek playwright Aeschylus, uh, he who learns must suffer even, even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget uh, comes drop by drop upon the heart until, uh, let's see, until in our own despair against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. So awful grace was the working title. Yeah. I'm very happy that I settled on a different title <laughs> a ways into it. I really love the title Ordinary Grace. Here's how this tender land came to me. It was given to me actually, it was delivered to me, the hand of God at work. So I was driving across Southern Minnesota and I was listening to Minnesota Public Radio uh, classical station. And this lovely piece of music came on that I had never heard before. And when the piece ended, the, uh, the, the announcer said, you've been listening to a, a select, um, an excerpt from the only opera that Aaron Copeland ever composed called. And I thought he said, this tender land. The actual title is The Tender Land. But I heard him say, this tender land. And I sat back in the car seat and went, there's my title. There's, there's my the title. title. Yeah. You know it when you hear it. Oh, absolutely. Here's a good, a good question I want to ask you um, that, that comes from uh, Pat Jackson Klebert. Uh, which other authors do you read? Uh, and, and especially uh, 20 years ago, I would try not to read fiction if I was writing fiction. But then I had to start because I was writing so slowly that I was never going to read again. Um, and so who do you find that you can read uh, that won't influence too much what you're doing on the page yourself? Well, I have to admit that occasionally I read writers that I want to influence me. Yeah. I read writers who make me strive mm -hmm. uh, to be a better writer. Um, Cormac McCarthy, 
Yeah. I have to be honest with you. I, I often finish a Cormac McCarthy novel and I'm not sure exactly what happened, but I love the way he got me there. Yes. <laughs> the beauty of his prose, the, the way he structures his, his, um, his work. Yeah. So Cormac McCarthy inspires me. Um, I touch base when I want to, when I want to remember what it is to create a profound sense of place, I reread Steinbeck. Yeah. Um, so I do occasionally pick out writers specifically to be influenced by them. Uh, and I'm not afraid to read, just broadly read anybody, yeah. because I, I, at this point in my, my writing life, my writing career, I'm so comfortable with who I am as a writer that I'm not worried about being influenced in an, in an inappropriate way by what yeah. I read. Um, and when I read, I got to tell you, honestly, if I'm reading outside the mystery genre, which is kind of my preferred choice, um, I read Midwest writers, Leif. I think yeah. uh, I, have, I have said this so many times and I'll say it again. I think there a case can be made that there is a Midwest voice in literature. Yeah. It's a very fair voice, but very eloquent as you are a perfect example of this. Have you read the new uh, the new Louise Erdrich novel? It's pretty spectacular. Watchmen. It's on. It's on the top of my list. Yeah, it's fantastic. I've heard nothing but beautiful things about it. So yeah. Louise Erdrich, she's one of the ones I read. Or um, yeah. Marilyn Robinson. Yeah, uh, who writes out of uh, Iowa. Gilead, Lilith, yeah. uh, Lilith. Um, yeah. Do you know the work of Kent Haruf or Haruf? Oh uh, yeah, I love I love Kent Haruf. Uh, yeah, exactly. So these are the people I read. Yeah, yeah. Good choices. Like, when you're I'm reading, good. let me ask: uh, when you're reading mysteries, are there mystery series that you especially admire that you would recommend? Well, I'm I on the hunt for a good end. mystery series right now. Yeah, I I read in the dark end of the genre. I have to admit. Uh, so James <laughs> Burke is one of my favorite mystery authors. Oh, he's terrific. Yeah. Yeah, dark, dark stories, but just a beautiful wordsmith, beautiful prose. What a yeah. voice he has. I like guys who write uh, who write out a profound profound sense of place and the, write about uh, the great outdoors. So C.J. Box and Craig Johnson, yeah, yeah, Margaret Cole, all of those people write out of uh, Wyoming. Um, do you miss Elmore Leonard as much as I do? Do you know? I have to be honest with you. I like. I have always liked Elmore Leonard's westerns better than his uh, his crime novels. Well, his westerns were wonderful. They were wonderful. But I did not discover them they until long after I had been reading his crime books. So I still think of him as, you know, a crime novelist. But his westerns were fantastic. Oh yeah, for anybody out there who only knows Elmore Leonard as a crime novelist, read his westerns. They they're are terrific. really good. Yeah, yeah, they're tremendous, and they they're kind of ahead of their time, I think. Uh, so here's a question for for us. Do you read your own audiobooks? And if not, why? <laughs> I added that part. <laughs> Do so, you? You know, I auditioned and they turned me down. <laughs> 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 and, oh, you know, I understand that. I understand that. Because when I auditioned uh, um, and read for them, my my men sounded like my women. My kids sounded <laughs> like so. You know, and a good, a good audiobook reader comes up with unique voices for all the characters. Yeah. And then here's the part that I just am amazed at, maintains those voices across the whole course of the, the work. That's just, that's a, a form of genius as far as I'm concerned. It so is. no, I don't read mine. Um, and I have no, I, I have very little choice in who does. With This Tenderland, I actually did, I was able to cast a ballot for uh, Scott Brick, who I think does a spectacular job of reading it. How about you? Yeah, um, I have never done it either. I would love to. Um, with uh, with Virgil, um, I asked if I could. I really made a play. I, I said, I'll be good at it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and they said, no, we don't think you will be good at it. <laughs> uh, and I, I said, oh, I, I was in radio for 20 years. Um, I, I'm, I'm a good reader. Uh, and, and I know these characters. I, I think I can do it justice, and I think it'd be a lot of fun. Um, and they said, you know, here's the thing. Uh, whenever an amateur reader uh, is allowed into the studio, they take 30% longer than a professional would take to do this. Uh, so they're 30% more, more expensive. I said, I will do it for free. And they said, no, we will hire <laughs> McLeod Andrews to do it. And I'm so glad that they did because... McLeod did a fantastic job. Yeah. Uh, 
and uh, he did way better than I could have. So, no, it's one of those things that I did sort of fantasize about being able to read my own stuff on the audio, but it's probably better that someone else do it. They're going to do a better job than I would. Yeah, and you get you get your chance when you do events and you read from your books. Here's we're we're drawing toward the the end of our time, but here's a really good one for us. Is there someone who played a pivotal role in you becoming a writer? That is a great question. What about you? Oh, for me, it's absolutely my brother Lynn, uh, five years older than me, um, and you know he and I wrote books together. Um, but before that, um, when I was in high school and he was in college, he started, he started writing short stories and then he would come home, let me read his short stories. And I would read them and I would forget that I was reading something that my own brother had composed. Uh, and it felt, it felt like, I don't know, it felt like time travel. It felt like, um, it was like when I would dip into a book by, by Robert Louis Stevenson or one of my other favorite writers where you forget what you're doing, you forget yeah. where you are and you're someplace else. And that's the way Lynn's stories struck me. And I thought if my brother can do this, I can do it too. Um, so without that, I, I don't know that I would do it. I, would, I don't know that I would have ever thought of it. What about you? Kid? Yeah, my dad, I have to say my dad. Yeah. Um, my father was a high school English teacher. And uh, both he and my mother were instrumental in my appreciation of the value of stories. Because when I was a kid, they read to me. Um, and I grew up, so I grew up thinking of the world in terms of stories. And for whatever reason, I always wanted to be one of the storytellers. My father was nothing but uh, supportive of that, that effort. Um, he turned me on to some of my favorite writers. When I was 18 years old, he insisted I read Ernest Hemingway, fell madly in love with Hemingway. Oh yeah, uh, which was my entree into so many other uh, great writers. Oh, um, terrific! So, yeah, my dad, and in the end, he was my probably my number one fan. He came to all of my events, and uh, oh, and that's I thrilling. Yeah, and I was so I was so. What I wanted to do was write books that my father, the high school English teacher, could be proud of. <laughs> oh, isn't that that reminds me of of a story can't about. Um, about Robert Louis Stevenson, who uh, really broke the mold in his family by becoming a writer. His family were builders of lighthouses. They were the Lighthouse Stevensons. And um, all around the English coast, it's dotted with the lighthouses that they constructed and oversaw. And his dad, Tom, Tom Stevenson, really looked uh, at Robert and his interest in, um, in writing stories as being um, unmanly and kind of uh, a feat and uh, something that he, he couldn't be proud of. Um, and then Tom came for a visit while Robert Lewis was writing Treasure Island. And every night, Robert Lewis would sit by the fire and read to his dad what he had composed that day in Treasure Island. Can you imagine this? Oh my. And, uh, yeah, from, from that moment, Tom Stevenson was a fan. And, and he thought, okay, Robert's all right. He did this pirate story just for me. <laughs> oh, that's such a lovely story. Thanks. thanks. I'd never heard that one before. And Robert Louis Stevenson was one of the writers who really influenced me when I was a kid. Yeah. Loved his work. Loved his work. Yeah. Um, is Annie still lurking uh, there in the background? We are sort of approaching the end here. I uh, am lurking, yes. Okay. <laughs> that describes what I've been doing this whole time. I've been... <laughs> I've been eavesdropping, it feels like, on you guys just hanging out, which has been great. <laughs> um, well, thanks yeah. for the chance to do this, Annie. It was a lot Absolutely. of fun. Oh, it's been a blast. Yeah, I'm so glad you guys got to talk. I think that you got to the questions that I'm seeing here on the Facebook comments. Um, thank you, everyone, who put one in there, because those are really good questions. Um, yeah, I just want to remind everyone that... Um, we, this has been a lovely talk about writing craft, and writing habits and influences. Um, there are also literal books that go with these two gentlemen here. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and you can purchase them at majorsandquinn.com. And I will drop direct links to both of their most recent books 
in the chat here, but also what you can do is you can just go to majorsandquinn.com and in the author field for searching, you can just type in their names because they have many books and you can browse around and see what we've got on the shelves. We are a used and new bookstore, so we often have a little combination of both, which is really great. Um, and we are available to, um, we are open for browsing. So if you're in the Minneapolis area, we are open for limited browsing now from noon to seven daily. Um, so swing by, see if there's room in the store for you at the time, remember to bring your mask. Um, or we do have um, curbside pickup um, at the back door of the store. And if you purchase something online, you can choose that as an option as well. So thank you very much for being here and listening. And is there anything else you guys want to add? Um, I think both Virtual Wander and this Tenderland would make wonderful Father's Day gifts. Oh, Great point. yes. <laughs> the bingo. He's a natural bookseller, people. You're hired. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for doing hey, this. was so much there. fun. Thanks again for uh, letting us do it. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And thank you again, everyone, for listening. And, you know, uh, this video will still be available on our Facebook page, Mavis and Quinn's Facebook page. Um, in the future. So if anyone missed it today, you can just send them there and they can watch it anytime. So thanks very much. And we're going to sign off now. <laughs> Bye everybody. Stay safe.